So we're going to be talking about PMTs today. Uh, and I came up with a working title uh, several months ago of PMTs of the future, uh, saying that I would fix it later and come up with something cooler. Um, and as you can see, I did not. So um, by, by show of hands, who here knows what a PMT is? OK. OK. Who here avoids using PMTs as much as they can? OK. OK. We are going to try and fix that. So uh, first off, just a little about myself. So I come from a little company called B Cubed. This is where the whole genesis of this new PMT idea came from. Um, we're a fun little place in Northern Virginia. We're hiring. We're looking for people. So uh, if you're interested in working for a fun place with uh, great benefits that loves GNU Radio, come talk to me. Um, so for those of you who don't know um, or have uh, blocked it from your memory, uh, a PMT, it stands for polymorphic type. And it allows us to group arbitrary data together, much like what you can do in JSON or a Python dictionary. The problem being that C++, being a strongly typed language, doesn't let you create variables that house random types in them, um, or unknown types. So this was uh, an effort to produce that kind, of, uh, that kind of type in C++. So it also includes uh, serialization and deserialization code so that you can transmit data over the network. Um, so if you're using the ZMQ blocks, those will, uh, will convert the PMTs for you and send them on the other side so you can, you can keep that metadata with you. Um, and in GNU Radio, these are primarily used for asynchronous messaging uh, between blocks. So any message block is working with PMTs and for stream tags. It is a standalone library. It's part of GNU Radio, but you could use it outside of that. Um, so to kind of motivate what's going on and to show examples of how things are and how they're changing, uh, I came up with an example somewhat near and dear to my heart is let's say that you are working on a spectrum survey application and so when you find a burst of energy, you're going to do some analysis on it and figure out what you can about it. And so we're going to produce uh, for our example here, a super complicated structure that we're going to figure out the bandwidth of the signal, the center frequency, the modulation type, and then we're going to have an integer ID associated with it. So in GNU Radio 310, um, prior to 3107, um, this is a way that you could create a PMT dictionary with all of these fields. So I've got my structure definition up top, and then uh, a function for converting that structure into a PMT dictionary so I can send it between blocks. So uh, this is using, uh, not my favorite syntax, uh, but we, we create the, the dictionary object, and then we add one key at a time. And so there's a lot of boilerplate here. You can see that in every dict add function, I pass the dictionary in, and then I get it back out as it adds that new key in. And then everything has to be converted to a PMT as I go. So there's this uh, PMT uh, MT, MP function, um, which is a nice magic function that says, oh, you're passing in a string. I'm going to convert this to a PMT string. Or you're passing in a float. That's going to be a PMT float. Um, so with uh, 3.10.7, so this is fresh off the presses, there's a new and improved way of doing this. Uh, so as any good programmer would do, I commented out uh, the original code and then added in the new way of doing it. Um, and so you can see that there's less boilerplate now. You're able to construct the object directly. So you're still casting or constructing PMTs for every object. Um, but it is, it is nicer and cleaner. So if you are on 3.10.7, Use this new format for making a dictionary, because it is uh, nice. So now we want to get the data out of this structure. So we're going to start with no error checking. Test, test. All right, I'm going to hold the mic now. All right, so no, no error detection here. 
And uh, so I declare, I declare uh, an instance of my structure, and then I'm going to convert one piece at a time. And so um, I have to know the, the type of everything that I want to get out. So the bandwidth is a float, so I'm going to convert that to a float. And then I ask for a dictionary reference, pass in the dictionary, pass in the key that I want to get, and then you also have to pass in a default value if that key isn't present. So in this case, I'm just passing in a, a null PMT, which would, if I were doing error checking, would allow me to know if the, the key is actually present in there. So the, the dictionary reference function returns a PMT, not a floating point value, which is what I actually care about, so that's why I have to convert that PMT to a float. So this, this is a little clunky. Um, there's a lot of typing I have to do, and we're not doing any error checking yet, so I, we're going to make this more complicated in a second. Um, so you have to ask, well, what if the key isn't there, and I try and, put, I try and convert a null PMT to a float? That's going to raise an exception, and then my program's going to abort, and I'm going to get the wrong type error and not know what's going on. So we can write, uh, we can add some error checking in, and this would be a lot of code, so I just did it for one value here. So the first thing we'd want to do if this is in a message, um, a message block is make sure that we're getting a PMT dictionary in. So we can check and see if it's a dictionary. If not, handle the error somehow. Then we want to, so bandwidth is our first field, so we're going to see if that key is in the dictionary, and then if it is, we're going to make sure that that value is a float, not an integer or a string or something else. If that's not true, then I can handle that error, and then declare my structure, get the value out just as I did before. So I can repeat this for all of the other fields in my structure. If you've got, we've got four here, if you've got more, it can be a lot of code that you're typing in there. Um, and I made several mistakes as I was typing up this example. Um, so it, it can be kind of, kind of tricky to do. So hopefully I provided some motivation for why we're doing something new. Uh, but just to kind of summarize, the, the API is kind of uh, inconsistent. It can be difficult to remember function names. There are, my, my favorite case is to convert to an integer you call from long, but if you want to know if it's an integer, then you call is integer. And that's my favorite because I mess it up all the time. Um, so as, as we saw, message validation is really hard. Um, and I've, I have made mistakes many times where one block is publishing a message and I receive it and I think that it is passing a signed integer but it's actually passing an unsigned integer. And there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of errors thrown and pulling out my hair. Um, and then the interface uh, is very different from what, what people are generally used to when they're writing C++ or Python code. Uh, there's a lot of new function calls to, to learn and C++ has evolved a lot over the years, and in particular C++ 11 through C++ 20 um, have introduced a lot of really cool features that allow us to, to get the flexibility of the PMT structure, but have it act like the, the C++ that we know and some of us love. Um, so I started this journey a few years ago, and as a, I guess, as a side note, this, was, this problem that I showed you was very similar to how I got involved in, in rewriting this. So I was at my desk one day, banging my head against the wall, trying to get a structure from one block to another and having a miscoding somewhere. And I said, I'm going to write validation code because I'm a good engineer. And after I fail for a while, I'm going to write the validation code. And I spent few hours on it and was getting more and more frustrated of, oh, why doesn't this work? Or what, you know, what's the syntax of this function? Or what happens here? And I now know enough that I could do it, but at the time, I just threw my hands up in the air and turned to my coworker and said, I could write something better than this. And as I went home that night, I thought, hmm, GNU Radio is open source. I could write something better than this. So I went and I contacted, uh, uh, sent, sent a message on the mailing list and said, hey, I have some ideas for uh, how PMTs could be improved, uh, and tried, tried to be as polite as I, as I could in my frustration. Um, and I got in touch 
uh, with uh, Josh, Josh Mormon in particular, who was already working on a new version for GNU Radio 4.0. And uh, I went and got involved with that. And so we had this original new implementation, uh, the, the old new implementation, if you will, where we were using uh, flat buffers. And I presented on this a few years ago. Uh, and flat buffers is a really powerful library that Google maintains for sending arbitrary data between, between code. Uh, you can get fairly high throughput in it. It's used in like a lot of video games um, for transmitting information about different stats or characters around. Um, but for how we do things in GNU Radio, uh, there's a lot of limitations. And so one big thing is that everything has to be managed in one central location. And GNU Radio has a more modular model uh, where we have our out of true modules and everyone is managing their own data. Um, there was also a lot of overhead because in say a video game, you may have an item that you have all of these well-defined characteristics for. And so you can define this structure and use it all over the place. For signal processing, we kind of have the reverse thing where we have lots of little structures or lots of different kinds of structures that we need. And so defining them uh, was, was not as universal. And the way that we ended up using it used a lot of CPU and memory. And uh, we weren't using any of the powerful features that it offered. So we now have a new, new implementation. Uh, and the new, new implementation uses a uh, C++ standard variant, um, which be careful if you're going to Google STD variant. Um, so the, the variant, which uh, this has been in boost for a long time in C++ 17, it got adopted into the C++ standard. This is a type safe union. So a union lets, lets you have one data structure that can represent one of multiple types. The problem is with a union that you don't know which type it is. So uh, the, the variant just adds a, an extra field that lets you know what type it currently is. Um, what's, what's nifty about a variant is, is you're using it in your program. Uh, you have this extra data field in there and there's a question of what type is it at this current moment, but the compiler is smart and it can frequently say well, the integer up here and now you're using the value and it can optimize that out. And so a lot of times you pay very little in terms of cost to use a variant. Um, the other nifty thing you can do with a variant is you can create what's called a visitor, which allows you to write one function that can work on all of the types or a subset of types within a variant. And so rather than having, having to say, well, if this is a float, do this. I mean, you end up saying, if this is a float, do this. If this is an int, do this. Uh, but they have a, a pretty nice syntax for, for interacting with a variant uh, without having to write a whole bunch of code. Uh, so I threw up a little bit of, of uh, example code here for declaring a variant. Um, and this particular, my variant, can be a float or an integer, and I'm assigning it a floating point number, um, you can ask, does this currently have a float in it with the holds alternative function? Um, and then you can call std get, which uh, will grab the value out uh, and return it back to a float. Um, so not the most exciting example, but it's a really powerful tool for representing somewhat arbitrary or uh, a one, one of many types, and this is the foundation of the new PMT. In fact, the new PMT really, it, it is a variant um, with some extra functions added. Uh, so most of the types that, uh, that you know and love or don't love from the current PMTs are supported. We've got uh, integers, floats, complex, bools. You can have uniform vectors. You can have uh, vectors of PMTs. Uh, there's a null type, there's strings. Uh, there are a few things that we left out. So uh, before there were tuples and, and vectors, and a tuple is essentially just a vector. Um, or a pair is a vector of size two. 
Um, and so you should be able to do everything that you could do before, um, but the interface is a little simplified by, by not trying to support all of the container types. Uh, so let's go over a little bit of how you would write code that interacts with these new PMTs. So uh, the vectors and the maps are the coolest ones, uh, and they allow you to use regular modern C++ features. And so here, you can declare a, a regular vector of floats and initialize it however you want. You can create a PMT from that. Um, the, the next line there is I'm creating a vector of PMTs. And so these are all of different data types. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the curly braces there is saying I'm passing in an initializer list, which is a little different than a constructor. Uh, but what ends up happening is it's going to create a PMT out of each of those op uh, objects there. And so you don't have to have any special code. If you remember from earlier, we had to do the PMT colon colon MP on each and every element. Uh, the, the new PMTs will automatically do the right thing for you. Um, we can also use range-based for loops. And so in this case, I'm adding four to each element in my, in my PMT. And you're able to access them nice and easily. There's not uh, an overhead cost to, to doing that. So it's just as fast as working on a, a vector. Um, you're able to uh, compare. This is, this is one of my favorite things. You're able to compare a quality of a PMT to any other object. And so that will make sure that the PMT is of the same type of, as the object and that the value is the same. Um, and then also it works, uh, you can do, you can do STDC out on a PMT or you can use format, uh, the, the new format library to, to print out a PMT. Um, with maps, so the, the code that we had from before, um, the, the, um, we, we've got the same example here, um, but using this new syntax, uh, it is very similar to, to what you have in uh, the 31070, uh, but you don't have to declare anything as a PMT in order to use it. Um, so yeah, yet again, it will, it will auto-convert everything for you. You can use range-based for loops on the map, just like you can with a standard template library map. And actually, under the hood, this is, I guess to be clear, this is a standard template library map. And under the hood, the vector is a standard template library vector. It is just stored in the variant that those are some of the options available to you. Um, so uh, an important note is that the map is storing PMTs. And like we talked about earlier with the variants, uh, you generally have to call an extra function to get the value out. Um, and so you will use the, the standard template library get function on the PMT to get the, the in this case, the frequency out. Um, it is nice, though, because uh, std get is a standard library function. You can find all the documentation online for it. Um, and anything else related to the variant, uh, it's read, readily available, documented, and we know it works. Um, and it will, it will raise an exception if you uh, if you try and, uh, if center frequency is a float and you try and pull it out as a string, it will, it'll raise an exception, much like what is in the current PMTs. Um, and just a reminder that you can, you can check the type uh, with holds alternative, and so it'd be std colon colon holds alternative float on this, and that returns a Boolean as to whether or not it is a float. Um, so, we're going to take a little detour and get to the most exciting part of this, I think. Um, so Ralph talked a little bit about reflection. And reflection is cool stuff, and it allows you to do really cool stuff. So it allows us to inspect. In this case, we're talking about compile time reflection. So at compile time, you're able to inspect and possibly modify things related to an unknown structure or object. Um, or I guess it's known to the compiler, but uh, you you don't have to prime it. You don't have to you don't have to code it all yourself. So this is a really common feature in languages like Python, which lets you do whatever you feel like with whatever uh, Go and Java. 
And uh, with the recent C++ standards, this is possible in, uh, in C++. And so I created just as a, a taste of what you could do, completely incorrect code, uh, but just to explain the idea, you could have a generic structure printer where uh, you would accept any structure in, and in this case, it is printing the name, the value, and the type. Um, so although this code isn't valid, um, you, you, can, you can produce code that does this. It was just, there was a lot of clunk, there was some clunkiness to it, and I figured that this, it was cleaner to show you the pseudocode than the actual code there. Um, so how are we using reflection for PMTs? So the whole point of my journey to, to rewrite the PMTs is I wanted to validate that the message I was getting in was, was of the correct type. And so if we remember from before, what I had to do is first make sure it was a dictionary, then go through each member and make sure that that key exists in the dictionary, and then that the value has the correct type, and then I can pull out the data. Um, that's a lot of boilerplate, it's kind of annoying to do, and so we've automated the whole thing. So in this case, I declare my detection structure just like before, and the one piece of boilerplate I need is this uh, REFL auto line, where I declare that I've got a the type is my structure, and then I declare the fields in there that I want to be able to access at compile time. That's all I need. You can use this, you can share it with, what, with uh, whomever else, and uh, they'll be able to run the same code on it. So from before, I am going to create my, excuse me, I'm gonna create my, my PMT from my dictionary, and here, because I defined the structure with the REFL auto part there, I can call the map from struct function, which does everything that we did before, and it will iterate over all the members and convert each of them to a PMT and add them to a dictionary. Um, so that one line of code converts everything for you. Uh, there's also, on the tail end, there's a two struct, which does the inverse of that, and so one line of code will convert from the PMT uh, back to your structure. And all of the validation is handled in that validate map function. So the validate map is a template function that takes as an argument the, the structure that you want to validate, and it goes through and it does all of those steps. It says, is this a dictionary? Does this dictionary have the, the right keys? Do all of the values have the right type? And if it does, then it, it passes, otherwise it doesn't. And so, um, all of that boilerplate, um, essentially, for converting your data structure into a PMT, for validating it and getting it back out, is roughly three lines of code uh, that it's been turned into here. So the hope is that this makes it a lot easier to work with PMTs, uh, get, put the data in, and get it back out. Um, so benchmarks are a funny thing. Um, so I, I like to wait until uh, right before submissions are due for uh, GRCon to start running my benchmarks. And so the, the first year uh, that I was working on this, um, we, had, we had all of our flat buffer based stuff in there and we ran some benchmarks right before submitting the, the, the talk and it turned out that serializing vectors was a lot slower in the new implementation than the old imp implementation. Uh, which is sad because we deal with vectors on a regular basis here and it's really common to want to transmit vectors between, uh, between blocks. So I found that there was a kind of a fundamental design flaw and went back through and realized that we needed to make some major structural changes to get that to work. So that was, that was two years ago uh, so I spent time making those structural changes, got that to be performing much better, and now a vector copy is uh, quite a bit faster in the new PMT than the old one. Uh, but then right before GRCon last year, I said, oh, let's run some other benchmarks. And I discovered that constructing the flat buffer objects was 100 times slower than constructing the old PMTs. And I figured, oh, if you're gonna use a PMT, you might want it to be created quickly. 
Uh, and it turned out that the flat buffer, the way that we were using it, was just really slow. Um, so then we switched to the variant, and I again, having not learned my lesson, decided to wait till the last second to run these benchmarks. But this time, they were good. So the, the results are much better. Um, so uh, there are some torture or some corner cases in the current PMTs. So we know that serializing a vector is kind of slow. It is uh, roughly twice as fast. It depends on the vector size now. Um, the map or dictionary in the current PMT, it's stored as a linked list. And so as that grows, it becomes more expensive to access it as a map. And so there was a data structure issue there. So that has also been fixed because we're using a standard template library map. Um, but in particular, having a, a map with 10,000 keys in it is not the most typical use case. So I did some benchmarks of what I would consider a more typical use case, um, which is you have a relatively small structure, maybe like the detection structure we just talked about. And you want to, uh, in this first case, you want to convert and then validate it. And I found that writing the code with the new PMT and the old PMT, not only is it easier to write the code for the new PMT, um, but it is roughly six times faster for uh, adding in a vector. So now we've got the, the equivalent of a PDU. Uh, so we've got this data structure and we've got a vector with a thousand elements in it. Um, that uh, a little less than three times faster with the new code versus the old code. Uh, and then for serialization, for taking the same PDU uh, serializing it to a string and then bringing it back back out, that's roughly four times faster. So um, we, we finally achieved uh, easier to use code that is also more performant than what we have now. Um, so the library is in pretty good shape now. Um, uh, Ralph and the team at FAIR uh, have submitted quite a few uh, fixes and uh, improvements to it and uh, it's, it's getting cleaned up. Um, there's, not, there's not a ton of new features that I see that need to be added, uh, though Ralph might have a different opinion on that, and we can talk later. But um, uh, some of the, the things that would be nice to add, uh, C++23 introduced new float types, uh, and they all have names and numbers just like the integer types. Uh, so we can, we can definitely add support for those uh, when we decide to support C++23. Uh, with complex types. Um, I also think it would be really nice to have a, we'll call it an SDR time type. So in C++, they've got a UTC clock, they've got a GPS clock, they have all these clocks. It might be nice for us to define whatever we say is an SDR clock that could pass through the, the flow graphs. So um, if, if we did determine that that was a good thing, that would be a great type to add there. Um, and then it might be good to do some more performance analysis, which I can wait till next September to start doing that. Um, but uh, it is, it's in pretty good shape. Um, but if you are interested in helping out or working with it, uh, please come talk to me. It's, it's a fun library and it is, it's kind of fun to work with. Uh, so with that, uh, if there's any questions, um, feel free to uh, to let me know, or I, yeah, I'll be here, or the, the guys from B Cubed as well. You can, you can come talk to us, and we'll, we'll let you know whatever you need. So, I saw a question over here. Oh. Uh, real quick, you, you mentioned serialization um, and, and that it's faster. What, what can you tell us about the, the serialization format, and is that more or less efficient than the current serialization in terms of space? Yeah, so the, the, old, so the old PMTs were stored as uh, STD any, and so that's a void pointer with some type safety features to it. And so to convert, a say, a map to the serialized format, there's a lot of pointer indirection that you have to do. Uh, because things are now stored directly in the, the variant, uh, access is a lot faster and easier. Uh, the, 
the format, which I do need to add some documentation. So if anyone loves documentation, come talk to me as well. Um, it is it is a fairly tight packing. So we are packing the the bytes necessary to store the data, and then there's a small header that I think is roughly four bytes per element. Um, and there's there's a continuation field kind of like in Unicode for if you have a vector of elements that you can have a subheader to, to put that in there. One more question for you. Uh, in the uh, validation, is, do you require all of what's in that structure or any? Or are they optional? Yes. So there's actually a uh, Boolean flag you can pass in for whether or not it needs to be exact. Um, so, so right now there's not a if it matches sum, but you could you could allow for the dictionary to have extra fields that were not defined in your structure, so you'd be able to combine things together, uh, and just based upon that flag whether it has to be exact or not. Thanks. Uh, let's uh, thank our speaker again. We're going to move on to some lightning talks. <laughs>